or turn with me please uh, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. We're going to consider Revelation chapter 8 today if we make it all the way through. And if we don't, that's okay, because we'll just carry on next week. This, this world's a bit crazy, isn't it, in its thinking. It's, uh, it's really got things a bit upside down. Um, it's very hard even convincing anyone these days, if we have to conv- or can convince them, that God exists. They, they want to deny that there is a creator. And uh, we see that, don't we? And, and uh, it's no surprise to God. In, in Romans, he, the Lord says through the Apostle Paul that um, their darkened hearts will hide the understanding of effectively the creator from them. What's clearly visible to them is just it's, it's there before them. They deny that truth in their unrighteousness. So we want to consider that because as we're moving through, the church is gone. And of course, as we were saying earlier on, surely there's some people around that going, where the heck did all those people go? Um, Then we have um, all these things start to happen through these these seals. And I just want to bring where we're at in context in line of last week's chapter 7 and how does that fit into the flow. People with their thinking must be thinking uh, or starting to think by the at least chapter 6 and these things start happening that uh, there is a creator. And we know that by the time we get to the end of chapter 6, they do know there's a creator, but what they have sort of quietly hidden in their hearts is that they refuse to repent to that creator. And they say, rather, let the rocks and the hills fall on us, which is... uh, frightening thing to do. So in chapter 6 we saw uh, the, the first seven seals, the lamb has taken the scroll and won't take too much time here to look through this. Seal 1, you've got the white horse, um, the, the false piece comes out, um, the conqueror with, no, uh, with a bow but no arrows. The red horse is then sent out then to disrupt this false piece in seal 2. Seal 3, the black horse who is famine, of course, out of that false war. And then the, the war that ensues, famine is one of those things that naturally flows out of that. And, of course, after famine comes death. Uh, it's a natural sort of progression as you move through um, seal 4. Seal 5, we have the, the testimony of those who are slain uh, during the tribulation because of the word of God. Uh, seal 6, we have the... First shaking of the celestial bodies, the meteorites of the moon of blood, and people acknowledging that God is God, but they refuse to repent, as I said before, which is that scary thing. And so we, we see there that that's uh, six seals. Six seals. Then there's uh, chapter 7. So we haven't had yet our seventh seal. What happened to the seventh seal? Someone asked me that before. So I just want to highlight that, that we haven't got to that seventh seal yet. So where is that? And uh, what would be good in your understanding of chapter 7 is to do what, like I have done in my Bible, is at chapter 7 I've drawn a little line and arrowed down all the way through uh, to the end of chapter 7 where I've done a line and arrow up. And I've put in there, and I'll read it to you. Uh, Where are we? Parenthetical break. Okay, what that means is there is a parenthesis. What's a parenthesis? It's a, a pause, you could say where what John has done, as we heard last week, has given extra information that we need to know before we can carry on to seal number seven. And so I've also put in here, um, those who are able to stand on the earth um, and in heaven during the the seal judgments. So that might help because that's obviously a summary of chapter seven. As we heard last week so clearly and so powerfully, what chapter 7 is, this parenthetical break between seal 6 and seal 7, giving us more information that uh, that we need before we can continue on. As we discovered last week, John is introducing to us two new people groups. Do you remember that? And we see it there quite clearly. There's the um, 144,000 uh, Jewish virgin male evangelists. Very important. They have the, the seal of God on their forehead, as it says. Um, they will survive this period of time, believe it or not. It's incredible to think that anyone would survive. But um, we have the fir- that first group. Then the second group is the martyrs who are before the throne 
un, uh, under the throne of God and uh, are now saved, obviously, they're in heaven uh, through that tribulation period. They're the other group of people who uh, we have uh, now been introduced to. Um, that's necessary information. I think to some degree also this break in what is coming gives us um, a real highlight that through all of this judgment that's coming, God is merciful, that God is gracious, that God through this will provide for his people and he will give those people who are on the earth a chance to repent. Isn't that incredible? That he has prepared 144,000 people to preach the gospel. And that's just his start point of what he's going to do to spread that gospel message throughout the world so people will have no excuse when it comes to the great white throne judgment to say, I didn't know that you existed. How could they possibly say that? There is no way they can honestly say that and stand before a holy God and say, you didn't tell me anything about your gospel. He is going to preach it from the heavens, literally, with an angel flying around the earth preaching the gospel. Everyone will know. So we have this beautiful picture of mercy and grace in the midst of what is to unfurl horrific judgment and we've only just started isn't that just horrible to think of being here in this time and of course for us right now this is a warning and i'll say this as we move through because i want you to to understand that the the only way of not being here if this was to happen uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, whatever it is, in our lifetime. The only way that you can avoid this is to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation today. That's the only way. Otherwise, well, as, as, as Jesus said, the, the wrath of God remains on us already. It's there on us already. We are under judgment. If we're not in Christ, we're under judgment already. So I call those of you who have not repented to repent in Jesus Christ. Place your faith on him. He is the savior who has paid the price for your sin. And so what we'll see now, and another thing I really want you guys to understand is how revelation unfolds. Because it's not linear in how revelation sort of runs out. If you think it's uh, one after the other, you're going to be very confused by the time we get to the end. So we, I want you to think of sort of a, a kaleidoscope effect where things are opening up and opening up and expanding, almost like a fan, if you will. So what we'll see here is um, the first six seals. Now we're getting to the seventh seal. And out of the seventh seal will roll seven trumpets. And out of the seventh trumpet as we'll see later on down when we get there, the seven bowl judgments. Do, so do you see how this is fanning out on itself as we move through Revelation? Very important for you to understand that. And we're going to hand out at the, uh, the, the end a graph, I believe, and that will uh, clearly uh, graphically depict for you how everything sort of fans out and, and, and comes together. So bear that in mind. It's not a straight line. It's not parallel. It's opening up on itself like a, a fan. Okay. Things are going to start to really greatly intensify. I think you're going to see that today. Um, we've had the first six seals, and now we're going to have the first four trumpets. And what we're going to see in these first four trumpets is an intensification of the judgments that are coming. But at the end of that, you'll see that there is a further intensification of those two remaining judgments, then, of course, the the seventh trumpet is the bowl judgments, which again are intensifying further on that, which is just frightening to think. Um, so we'll see that. And each of these is for a non-defined period of time, with the exception of the fifth trumpet, which we know is for five, a period of five months. And we'll see that next week. Okay. All right. So with that said, we're going to consider verses... Uh, chapter 8, verse 1, to the end of chapter uh, 8, verse 13, that is. That'll take us to the end of the first four trumpet judgments. And what we'll see is the, uh, the last seal will come, uh, out of there will come all the remaining judgments. 
that last seventh seal, all the rem remaining judgments come out of that last seal. Because everything's, remember, expanding out on itself. Um, God is, is really casting upon the earth judgment. He is reclaiming his creation. What was the lamb doing as he unfurls it? Breaking the seals. Why was he breaking the seals? So we could see the contents of the scroll. Why do we need to see the contents of the scroll? Because it is the title deed to the earth. And rather than boundaries and markers, it's how it's to be reclaimed. And now the seventh seal is snapped. And we have the fullness of how the earth is to be reclaimed. So today we're going to see... Um, the Lord is really going to pour out wrath on the ecology of the earth. The ecology. With the first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet, the fourth trumpet. And I think by the time we get to that point, we'll be done for the day. I don't think we'll want to look at five and six because we'll have had enough looking at that. It's, uh, it is pretty, pretty crazy. All right. Well, let's look together here at verse 1. And when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's a very, a very rare thing. A very rare thing. All since the fall of heaven has been building to this point. Everything. You have peals of thunder, you have lightning, you have flashes, you have noise, you have um, the, the angels around the throne, the flying creatures, constantly day and night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You have the 24 elders falling down before God, worshipping. You have all of this din and activity going around. You have the martyrs um, before the, um, under, under, the, under the altar. You have all this going on, all of a sudden... All of a sudden, silence. Silence. Nothing can be heard. When the lamb, the, the lamb, what, what do we say? That we, we need to be reminded that it is the lamb who's doing this. The lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. He is the one with the scroll in his hand. When the lamb, he's in possession of it, the title deed of the earth, he snaps the seal. When he opens a seal, Silence. Silence about half an hour. I talked to a few people about this, and, and they said that perhaps what I should do is, um, in order to demonstrate this, is just remain silent for the rest of the time, the remainder of the time, so, but, uh, and then take my seat. But um, I, I thank them very much for the joke. And <laughs> well, we won't do that. We want to learn. Just imagine, no noise. Not a cricket. Nothing. For half an hour. Why? What is to follow is monumental. What is to follow is awesome. What is to follow has never happened before. I was also asked a question, well, why does it say half an hour? Isn't there uh, sort of any, it, it, no time in heaven? That's a very good question. No time in heaven. That's right. But John is in heaven, well, at least with the vision. He has a vision of heaven. And so for John, there is time. And how else do we understand that period of silence? So the Lord allows us that, that visual, uh, or what we understand so we can understand what is going on. Then I saw, says John, Seven angels who stand before God. You see that there? Verse 2. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God. Okay. So after this 30 minutes of silence, and yes, there is still silence at this time, but John has looked and he's seen what is happening. The next scene that is unfurling before John is these seven angels who stand before God are being given seven trumpets. Uh, we, we've sort of labeled these, uh, these guys presence angels, the presence angels, because they stand in the presence of God. We, this is not the first time that we've come across these presence angels, at least one of them, because if you've read the Gospels, which I assume you all have, in Luke uh, 1.19, uh, 
we have this. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. So we, we have introduced through when uh, the angel uh, Gabriel is going to Zacharias, he stands before him and tells him who he is. You must believe him because he is a presence angel. He stands in the presence of God. That's our, really our first look at a presence angel. But now we know that there are at least seven, maybe one more even, or maybe even more than that again. Why would God limit that? But we know at least there are eight presence angels in play here today. And seven trumpets were given to them. These angels are about to commence their part in the judgment. They've probably been um, known, or they've probably known about this for a very long time, if time is a thing to angels, I'm not sure. Why, why trumpets? Well, in, in Scripture, trumpets announce something. They sound an alarm. They're used also in worship. Something incredible is about to happen. It is to be announced. Trumpets will announce the rapture. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15.52 and 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And here they are announcing these ever-increasing judgments of God out of the seal number 7. The first four trumpets are going to destroy the ecology of the earth, the ecological system, the, the life, the trees, the plants, nature itself are going to be destroyed. That's global warming for you, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I believe, don't get me wrong, I believe in, uh, in being a good steward of the earth. But this place is temporary. And God is going to really do a number on the ecological system. And, and that's uh, the global warming guys and all the save the whales and save the planet guys are going to be in a real sort of um, tiz. <laughs> so let's look at uh, uh, well next after that will be uh, the two trumpets next week we'll look at and that's where uh, demonic hordes are, are really uh, let loose on the people and, and, and set to destroy humanity and of course the last judgment, uh, uh, trumpet uh, introduces the bold judgments so currently these presence angels have their trumpets in hand and they're waiting for one more thing to happen before blowing the trumpet. Okay, so let's look at that. And another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer. Another angel. Okay, what is another angel? Alos in the Greek, another, alos. A very important word. Because it's, it's, it's very important to see these little details. Um, another of the same kind. Now a lot of people go, oh look, there's Jesus Christ. He's the, the you know, he's the, the angel. Um, you know, thinking back to the Old Testament and um, the angel of the Lord. No, because it's another, a loss, another of the same kind. What, what kind? Of the presence angels. Another presence angel comes and stands at the altar with a golden censer. So it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a presence angel who does this. And just as an aside, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ has never been called the angel of the Lord in the New Testament. Never. It's not there. So why would it all of a sudden be here? Um, and he's already been described for us in verse 1 as the lamb. The lamb. So why would it change now to another angel? That doesn't fit. So just so you know um, fully that this is another angel. A loss of the same kind of presence. Another presence angel. Okay. And it's important to know that. What did he do? He came and stood at the altar. The, you know, the, the altar is, this is the real altar, like the copy on earth that was made of, of gold. And we see that in Exodus, it was made of gold. So this is the real thing of the copy which was in the Jewish temple. And it's also, this real Altar has already been seen in, in um, Scripture. We see that if you want to have a look at it afterwards, because we don't have time now. Uh, Isaiah 6.6, 6, if you want to note that down, and Ezekiel 10.2. Ezekiel 10.2. Those are two places where there is reference to this brazen, uh, sorry, the, the, this, um, um, this altar. So have a look at that. And he said, and the angel, and he, that is the angel, 
was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the altar, the golden altar before the throne of God. The angel was given by whom? Well, it doesn't say. It doesn't say who gave this much incense. But this incense does symbolize the multiplied prayers of God's people. The multiplied prayers of God's people. And I believe personally that God the Father gave the much incense to the presence angel. If you were, were wanting to know who this other being or person was. Now why, did he, why was he, he given it? Well it says because he was given much incense so he might add it to the prayers of the saints. It's verse 3. Or, that are already rising from the altar. What prayers? Well what do, what do we pray for? It's probably intensified as to, uh, they in, have probably intensified prayers as to what we're praying for now. The return of the Lord. That people will repent and turn to God. That sin and Satan would be destroyed. Just think, if you're martyred for your faith in Jesus Christ, what would you be praying? That's what I would be praying. That those people would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and Him as Savior only. Because there is no other Savior, no other name under heaven by which men must be saved but the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're praying for. Maybe even that their deaths may be avenged. Verse 4, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Now you can see from this verse clearly that these are definitely prayers of the saints who are before the throne of God, have been killed for believing in Christ. And as uh, this, this in, the incense rises with prayers to God, God is in agreement with these prayers. And why, why can we say that? Because of what happens next. The scene is set. The prayers of the saints are about to be answered. And they're rising before God. And the presence angels are have their trumpets in hand in the waiting anticipation. This another angel, this other presence angel then takes the censer that is filled with fire from the altar and he throws it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. We haven't even got to a trumpet yet. If heaven was silent, it's not silent anymore. The angel has taken the sense and he's it's been filled with fire from the altar and he's thrown it to the earth, which as an act, it symbolizes that what is about to occur is in direct response to the prayers of the saints. Do you see that? And that symbolic action that God is about to answer prayer. The prayers have been in agreement with the will of God. And God is about to act. Peals of thunder. Sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Sounds almost like what's happening around the throne of God in heaven. Peals of thunder. Flashes of lightning. And as the sensor hits the earth, a massive earthquake maybe even bigger than the one that we had in chapter 6 happens. Just think of the disruption now, before we've even got to a trumpet, of the ecology of the earth, probably spike tidal waves, maybe even cracks in the earth open up, maybe lava spewing out, maybe volcanic eruptions, all this going on, and gas is going into the atmosphere. It's terrifying to be on the earth at this time. How could you possibly live buildings collapsing, all the uh, infrastructure completely destroyed. Think of Christchurch so many years ago. What happened there? A small earthquake, and the place was leveled to the ground almost. It has taken decades to recover. And here we're talking about a massive global earthquake. Chapter 6. Now the seven angels had, who had their seven trumpets prepared to blow them. No more silence in heaven. The first angel, verse 7, blew his trumpet. And here comes the first of the trumpet judgments. And there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. Hail and fire have, always, have been used in judgment before. 
Hail was one of the, the ten plagues in, in Egypt. Do you remember? Have you, you remember back to the ten plagues of Egypt? One of those was hail. What happened to Egypt? Do you remember? All of their fields of, um, of corn and all their, their crops were completely wiped out. Massive hailstorms, completely destructive. All their uh, animals that were in the fields died. They were killed. You actually can go on to YouTube and see um, video clips of massive balls of hail about the size of tennis balls falling from the sky, smashing cars to pieces. You know, this, is, uh, this is a divine hailstorm. It's, it's not just some localized thing. It is thrown upon the earth in fury and judgment. Crops are destroyed. Livestock are destroyed. We see this in Isaiah 28, 2 and Haggai 2, 17. It details how God has used judgment against Israel as well. Uh, um, hail in judgment against Israel as well. Fire from heaven. Reminds me of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember that? Very localized thing. Where God rained down judgment because of the wickedness of of that place sulfur and fire from heaven came down incinerated it completely and so we've got hail and fire coming down from heaven Sodom and Gomorrah is very localized this is this is global this is huge just think of what's going to happen you've got hail you got fire from heaven things are just going to burn up You've had an earthquake already. This is going to set everything on fire. But it was also mixed with blood. We don't know if it was actual blood or if it was perhaps the appearance of blood. Maybe, um, maybe what was happening with the, the earth causing the, um, the earthquakes and all the gases going into the atmosphere has mixed it and made it a blood color. But I actually think it's mixed with blood. Personally, that's my opinion, taking sort of more of a literal interpretation. I do believe that it is hail, hail and fire mixed with blood. It's coming down. God did this in Egypt. God is God. He can do what he wants. And I do believe that it is, it is blood. He's thrown down to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And the green grass was burned up. I wonder what sort of um, footprint, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, carbon footprint that will create. <laughs> Far out. That's, that's going to be a problem here. What if, how do we offset this? Crikey. One third of the earth was scorched, probably at least rendered um, in, in or uh, incapable of food production for a time. The, the trees are burned up. Global warming's on the increase. One third of the trees are gone. What happens if you lose one third of the trees around the world? What, what do you think of the ecosystem? What, what's going to happen there? You know, the, the trees control a lot of the environment with the, the moisture they produce and the moisture they consume and the oxygen they produce and the carbon dioxide they, they filter out. And that's just a natural thing, right? It, they, they purify, they're the lungs of the earth. They purify the earth. A third of them are gone. Imagine that. Brazil's rainforest, say, gone. Sorry. <laughs> it's gone. Um, what about the, the grass? Well, uh, all the green grass is burned up. However, grass does what grass does, as Bevan is very thankful for, and it grows, right? It grows sometimes. He's sometimes thankful that it grows. <laughs> um, you know, because we, we know it grows back because later in Revelation it's uh, scorched again. But at least for this time, it's, it's scorched. You know, the, the cult of uh, Mother Earth worshippers are going to be very, very perturbed. Because it's being destroyed by Father God. You know, it's been ripped apart by the Creator, our Heavenly Father. Why? Why is this happening? Because people refuse to repent and acknowledge their creator and turn to their savior, Jesus Christ. 
And so again, I, I say to you, if you haven't turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Yes, they would rather stubbornly die in their sins, as we read the end of chapter 6. And the second angel is going to blow his trumpet. The second presence angel is in play. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Something like a great mountain burning with fire. What do you reckon? Have you ever seen the, uh, the movie Armageddon? It's actually a really corny movie. I kind of like it. But you got Bruce Willis and his team of misfits, and there's this massive asteroid that's hurtling towards the Earth, and they have to go up there and drill into it and blow it up with a nuclear device so they can split it and have it drift past and avoid Armageddon. It's not going to be like that. <laughs> Sorry to say, good one, um, good one, Hollywood, but no. It's not going to be like that. No one's going to be able to go up in a spaceship and, and, and blow this little baby up. This is probably the size of a continent. It's huge. Something like a great mountain. A massive piece of rock hurtling towards the earth. And as it enters the atmosphere, it starts to burn. You know, we've seen this, don't we, with space junk. We see it with little asteroids these days. As it enters the atmosphere, and we think, oh, look, beautiful shooting star. Oh, not this one. It's not beautiful. It's not beautiful at all. It's burning with fire and it's thrown into the sea. You know, scientists have long feared that this is going to happen. They have long predicted that what they call a global killer is hurtling towards the earth from outer space and it's going to wipe out mankind as we know it. They're very fearful of that. Why? Because they have no hope. They have no hope that God is in control. But we have hope because we know God is in control. And when it does happen, it happens according to his judgment. That's okay. You know, I read in the paper just last week that they reckon they've detected something that's on course for Earth. That's big. They read that in the Herald. You know, my reply was, come Lord Jesus. You know, could this be the one that is this particular one? The God's already set it on course? Could be. No, I think God plans ahead like that. What happens though? A third of the sea becomes blood. This thing enters the atmosphere, it burns up, and as it burns up, it smashes into the earth. Strikes the sea. Well, that makes sense because two thirds of the world is water, right? So just a sheer chance it's going to strike the sea, but God says it's going to, so it will. And a third of the sea becomes blood. Can you imagine the tidal wave? I reckon that it's actually going to completely vaporize some of the water. I think the shock wave and the heat and everything, wherever it hits, it's just going to poof. It's going to go. It's going to just turn to steam straight away. It's going to be that hot, that big. It'll be a nuclear explosion type impact. And I shudder the earth. It's going to be incredibly, when I say awesome, I mean fearfully awesome. The shock wave that will go out from there will send out uh, just whatever water is left, tidal waves going out. The, the, the wind will knock down trees and buildings and people and homes. Poof, gone. A third of the sea becomes blood. No doubt. It, it could be that because so many sea creatures have died that when the water does come back, it's, it, it's just putrefied and it's turned to blood. It could be that. Or it could be literally God turns a third of the water to blood could be any of that. The sea's ecology is, by and large, gone. You know, at least for a time, we can't fish from the water. You know, it, it's polluted. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, sort of talked about that now. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Can you obviously imagine those, you know, waves of like I was saying, the blast of that would wipe everything from the face of the water. A third of the ships were destroyed. No more large fleets of ships. No more real international sea trade. No more getting stuff from A to B. Ports, harbours, all destroyed. Talk about sea level rises. Crikey, you know? It's gone up real quick and come down pretty quick too. <laughs> you know? 
The third, the third angel, uh, verse 10. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. Presence angel number three. A great star fell from heaven. Star, Astera. Where do we get the word asteroid from? Astera. It can refer to any celestial body. Any, anything except with the, uh, with the exception of, say, the sun and the moon. That, that's not counted in this word. And it comes down to earth blazing like a torch. I don't know, when I, when I read this, I, I picture like an asteroid or something coming into the Earth's atmosphere, um, or like a comet, you know, like a, a big ball at the front and a, a long tail. It looks like a torch. That's what I picture it to be anyway. So here we have this celestial body, perhaps a comet, perhaps another smaller asteroid coming to Earth, but maybe, maybe it comes on a shallow angle, and maybe it skims around and hooks into the Earth's atmosphere and gets pulled in, and as it does, it covers around the Earth, and as it comes in, it breaks up, and it spreads itself over a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Either way, it, it, it falls on the earth. Maybe it just comes in and goes, poof, who knows. But the name of the star is Wormwood. This is really important. It's very interesting too. Wormwood uh, in the, the Greek is aspenthos, absinthos. So you get that right, absinthos. Do you, do you recognize that? Absinthos. We get a, a word from absinthe. What's absinthe? Yeah, well, people, it comes from a, a shrub. Absinthe that comes, it's produced out of a, the absinthe, um, absinthe shrub. And it has a compound in its leaves that are so toxic that in some countries that drink is banned. It is that toxic. It's bitter. In fact, in, in um, much of the Old Testament, the word has been used uh, Mara uh, and translated uh, wormwood, which means bitter. So here we have the same sort of thing. Whichever way, the, it means that the, the waters of the earth are going to be poisoned and made bitter, undrinkable. We, if you want to read some of the Old Testament appearances of the word, you can see it in Deuteronomy uh, 29.18 and uh, Proverbs 5.4. Jeremiah um, 9.15 and 23.15 is a, a good one. Um, There's just a few other places. Um, it has a profound effect. It says, A third of the waters became wormwood that is bitter, that is absence, poisoned, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Just imagine what's happened on the earth. Can you imagine? We've had a massive earthquake. A lot of what's gone, or what we have as what we'd consider society today has been shattered just by that earthquake. And then what has happened, we've got these other judgments all destroying the world's ecosystem. Who's going to be hungry? I don't, everyone is going to be starving. Because the only food there is is probably going to be rotting. You can't go fishing anymore. The fish was a great resource. The water's polluted pretty much, at least a third of it is. And you can survive a long time without food. You can survive without salt water. But we cannot survive without is the most precious resource, precious resource that the world has, and that is its fresh water. You've got days days and what people you can see here people have died because the, the water's been made bitter it's bitter it's poison yet they're so desperate for the water that they drink it anyway and they kill themselves because they're so desperate for the water it's a dire situation people are dying because of the lack of pure fresh water within days of the star falling from the sky probably Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have died from desperation, from thirst. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet. 
Angel, presence angel number four steps up and he sounds his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck. And a third of the moon. And a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Okay, so until this point, we've had lots of conferences. We've had a lot of... Uh, uh, meetings of Save the Wells and Save the Planet and um, Earth's ecology is uh, under attack, so how do we fix this sort of UN conventions? Um, what do they do now? They can't control the sun, the moon, the stars. They have no influence over that. If they didn't want to acknowledge God before, surely they would now. The sun was struck. At least for a time anyway. We know in Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God then cranks it up again with the heat. And so what have we got? We've got the sun was struck. A third of it is gone. All a massive, massive global cooling. Um, climate change for you again. Um, <laughs> you know, you've, you've got what was a maybe semi-stable um, environment to live with the least temperature. All of a sudden... <sighs> It's gone down to minus 30 degrees. It's cold. Very, very cold. A third of the moon. What's, what's happening there? Well, imagine without the moon. What does the moon do? It controls the, the tides. It controls the wind. Okay, we've got what's left of the water. And we've got no tides anymore. Therefore, surely more fish are going to die because it's going to become putrid. And stale with no tide means no oxygen in the water. Maybe the wind will help with that. And the third of the stars go out so the night might be dark and all of a sudden you've got what is a normal period of daylight has been cut into a third. And so we don't even have the daylight anymore, at least these people don't, because I will be with the Lord. This has been prophesied since the Old Testament. Ezekiel 32, 7 and 8 says... When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven, I will make you dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord. Joel 2.10 and subsequent verses. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Chapter 315, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Do you think that's bad? Then I looked, verse 13, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe! Woe! Woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the, at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Woe, woe, woe. In the Hebrew, it's ayah, ayah. What's about to happen is so bad. An eagle is a strong bird of prey. It's ready to consume its victim. God's judgment will come swiftly and powerfully and it will be deadly. Worse is still yet to come. And we'll find out that next week. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so awestruck at what you will unleash on the earth as you prepare to take back what is rightfully yours, what has been reusurped by the usurper Satan. And Lord, we are so thankful that you have not left us under judgment alone 
but you have provided salvation for those who would believe in your son. And you call all people to repent and to turn to Christ. For he has saved his people from their sins if they would but turn from their pride, stop worshipping themselves and the creature and worship the creator. So Lord, we pray that whoever is hearing this message, who has heard it today, Lord, grant them repentance so that they may meet you in the air when the Lord Jesus Christ comes for his church. For those, Lord, who refuse to repent and perhaps if you so choose to come soon, walk into the tribulation. Lord, may they have heard the true gospel so loud and clear that they know exactly what is happening. That, Lord, you may use them as a witness of your grace and mercy that they may believe in that time and not be one of those who says, let the rocks fall on us and hide us from the Lamb. May they repent then. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the warning you give through Revelation. And we thank you most of all for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We love him. Thank you, Lord. Amen.